Now, and admitting Corina. All right. Perfect. Good, we are live. So welcome everybody to another session of the Zurich developers.net user group. I'm going to share the screen. I hope it works properly. Can you see the screen? Yes. Lovely. So today we have uh, the start of our double take sessions, which is we have several sessions that will take on a topic with uh, two speakers and two different uh, sections. Uh, today, it's everything about functional programming. They, even some would say it's functional programming, C sharp versus F sharp. So, which is basically the topic. First of all, thanks to our sponsors offering solutions, VBV for texture at, at our almost forgotten location menus, Impact Hub Zurich, the Stanford Group, and to our partners, Azure Zurich User Group, uh, .NET Central, HiUrs and Dornay Day Switzerland and Swiss Angular. Who are we? Well, it's me, Jose, it's Powell, it's Michael, Nigel. Nigel is here. I see you. Hey, Nigel, good to see you. Uh, Logan, Fabian, and Mark, Mark Muller. What do we do? We organize events from developers for developers like you, share knowledge, excitement, networking included, and beer and pizza. Back in 2019, maybe we will have it again this year. What can you do? You can follow us on Twitter if you don't do that already at, at .NET Zurich and LinkedIn. We have a group there. We are active, at least lately. You can join our meetup group that probably you have already. You can tell your peers, help us grow and propose content and a speaker. Like for example, a talk on, um, let's say, um, source generators. Stefan. No, no, no. <laughs> All right. Today's agenda is a quick introduction to the Zurich.net user group, which we are having at the moment. We will see first the session why every day as a developer would be easier with F sharp by Urs Ensler, and then functional programming with C sharp. So it's F sharp versus C sharp, basically, with Simon Painter. So it's going to be interesting. Also, remember the promise from Urs that he will not mention strange or complicated jargon. So I'm really looking forward to it. <laughs> it's, it's quite a challenge. And, and then we will stop streaming. Each session will take uh, from 40 minutes to one hour. And then we will uh, have a bit of a small stop for questions and introduce the next talk. Then we will go stop the streaming and we will have a private discussion with our speakers. So there you can ask whatever you did not dare to ask in, in the session. So I would also ask that you leave the questions F sharp versus C sharp at the end. Apart from that, I will introduce both the speakers now. So it's something which is done. Why every day as a developer would be easier with F sharp? That's the session that Urs will deliver. Urs is a person I know since a long time. He is uh, one of the leads of the .NET Central, and he was really kind together um, um, with uh, his, his peer uh, to, to help us uh, to, to set up the user group. So I'm really thankful uh, to him and Daniel, Daniel Marbach. So that's, that's really good. Um, and he is also an amazing speaker. And today it's, uh, well, two amazing speakers you will see in a moment. Then uh, you can see the, uh, Twitter handle, it's Urs Ensler, and his LinkedIn, which is the same. And then we have Simon Painter. Hello. Uh, yes. Want to say something, Simon? No, just hello. Hello, that's me. Hey. Yeah. hey. <laughs> so he will deliver functional programming with C Sharp, if that, can, if that can really be done. He will show us how. I really 
don't know uh, Simon. I know that he's really, really very prolific speaker. He speaks with a quite interesting concept. If you can find his page and look at that, like a bit of uh, improvisation, a bit of like art and music. So that's his uh, impromptu on, on the art of public speaking. So it's looking forward to his talk today. Uh, you can find Simon with uh, Matt Simon J. Uh, I don't know if that has any connotation to the Matt Hatterer, probably yes. Um, I think an ex girlfriend chose that for me. It's probably more um, <laughs> saying something about my character. And, right. uh, and John is my middle name, hence the J. Sounds good. All right, then um, we are done here. So I'll give the stage to Urs. Urs, the stage is yours. Thanks, Jose. So just have to set up the screen sharing. So. With all the Zoom windows at the correct position, it's always tricky. So. Oh, by the way, if anybody has a question, you can ask that um, as, as you figure it out. All both the speakers are really happy to take them as they come. So be there and just put your video or your audio and ask that directly to them. Otherwise, you can type it in the chat and I will ask to the speaker for you. It's your choice. Thanks, Jose. Exactly. If you have a question, ask it, because that's the reason why I like meetups better than conference talks, because it's easy to be interactive. So and it's for everybody more fun if it's interactive and not me talking for 50 minutes um, and you just listening. And if you like, enable the camera so I can see you and don't and I don't have to talk to my camera only. So, so Happy faces would be nice. So today I want to talk about why I think our life as developers, especially .NET developers, would be easier with F Sharp, easier than with C Sharp. But first, a little bit of context. Um, we built the product called Time Rocket. It's an attendance time tracking tool. Yeah, and all the marketing is in German, not in English, because our market is Switzerland. And we are really a small company. So the whole company is 15 people and we are four developers. So, and we, we provide this app Time Rocket as a software, as a service on Azure. And with four developers, we have to do everything from uh, helping gathering the ideas, implementing the solutions to the problems that our customers and users have to deploy it, to maintain it, to run it. So nowadays it, this was probably called DevOps. And yeah, with four developers, this is really hard. And therefore we look for simplicity everywhere. Everything has to be as simple as possible. Otherwise it wouldn't be possible with only four people. And one thing that is very important to us, especially to me, is simple code. Uh, what do I mean with simple code? Uh, code should be very easy to read and understand. So even code I wrote or my colleagues wrote a couple of months or years ago, uh, we should still be able to understand it quickly. So the product is now in, it, in its seventh year. So we built up some old code base already. And the code should be easy to refactor and to adopt because uh, we always introduce new features. We have to change features because we have new insights. We get a lot of feedback from our users and customers and we want to make our app better and better. So some code in the seven, in the seven years, maybe we've, we, we, we've re refactored that four or five times. And yeah, we refactor a lot, we change a lot. So it has to be as simple as possible. And a couple of years ago, maybe two and a half years ago, I asked myself, yeah, we are developing with C-sharp on the .NET platform for the backend. We have a client that is uh, Angular TypeScript. 
And for the backend, I ask myself, I have seen a lot of F-sharp talks and I was in some F-sharp workshops and every speaker says F-sharp is so much simpler than C-sharp. So I ask myself, yeah, we want simple code. So could F-sharp possibly help us? So in 2020, I talked my team into doing an experiment and I was allowed to rewrite a part of our system from C-sharp to F-sharp. So the idea was that I re rewrote the same submodule in F-sharp. So it was feature, uh, it had the same features. And then we could look at the code, it does the same. It doesn't look quite the same. And you could compare it and decide, okay, which code is simpler for us. And the for us is important because what we do is, I would say, it's a typical business application, like probably most of you are writing. So it's not big data, it's not uh, very mathematical, it's just some business logic, getting some data from the database, crunching some data together to present it in the client. So that's, this is the kind of code I will talk today. And I, wrote, I rewrote that part, we looked at it, and it was clear that from now on, we want to do more with F-sharp because it's way simpler. So it continues until today that if possible, we write new code in our, in our system with F-sharp and um, that's only possible in certain areas because if you have to add a small feature in the existing C-sharp code base, of course we do that in C-sharp. But if it's one of the newer subsystems or something completely new, we, we write it in F-sharp nowadays. So the, in the last half year, I probably wrote more F-sharp than C-sharp, but I still write C-sharp uh, at least once a week. So I have a history of 20 years of C-sharp. I started with C-sharp 1.0. So I know C-sharp really well. So way better than I do with F-sharp. And I don't want to be this talk to be a, a bashing talk about C-sharp. So I added this slide where C-sharp shines. And if you are looking for the best possible tooling, the best possible IDE support, then yeah, C-sharp support is probably one of the best there is for any programming language. And not to say that F-sharp tooling is bad, but it's not as good as C-sharp tooling. Compiler is very fast, C-sharp compiler. The F-sharp compiler, it depends on what languages you compare. Compared to C-sharp, F-sharp compiler is slow. Compared to the Angular compiler, F-sharp is really fast. But uh, Angular is really, really, really slow. Uh, debugging is easier in C-sharp than in F-sharp, especially if you have async code, but it gets better and better. And I don't debug that much anyway. I like to write complicated code with TDD, test-driven development. So, Debugging is not a main concern for me. If you want to do some low-level programming, um, you probably should take Rust and not .NET, but if you do in .NET, maybe C-sharp is the better fit. Then once upon a time, I had to say that if you, if you want high performance when you have IO tasks, you have to go with C-sharp. That's not true anymore. F-sharp task performance is as fast as C-sharp task performance nowadays. Task, not async, so it is test. Then when you do a lot of WinForms or WF programming, they are built for C-sharp, so they're just easier to use from C-sharp. You can use them from F-sharp, but I never done that, but I guess it's not that nice. And if you like, some heavy OO libraries like Entity Framework. They are just a little bit easier to use from C-sharp because they are built with C-sharp in mind. You can use them from F-sharp, but again, it's not really fun. So if you do F-sharp, you use other data access libraries than Entity Framework, for example. 
And of course, if you're really, really into implementation uh, inheritance with a lot of classes derived from many other classes, yeah, that's the reign of C sharp, not of F sharp. F sharp can do that, but it's not that nice. Yeah. Isn't, isn't that really an anti pattern doing that to that extent? Yeah, for me, yes. <laughs> but I, I would say it depends on the problem. But implementation inheritance, even a lot of OO experts say don't do that, only use composition. So, yeah. But if you like it, yeah, you're better off with C sharp. So, but now we get into F sharp. And one thing in F sharp is that everything is an expression. So in C-sharp, you have statements and expressions. And this is some C-sharp example code. It's not really sophisticated. Just pass in a Boolean. If it is true, return 42. Otherwise, return 17. Written in a really extremely statement-heavy uh, style. And statements can have some problems because I cannot simply extract this result equals 42. This is not an expression I can extract. I can extract 42, but not the, the statement. So statements are not so nice for composing new things out of existing things. Then uh, actually, this is a side effect. I assign 17 to result, and result is defined in an outer scope. So its statements are based on side effects. And side effects are just more difficult than expressions. You will see that. And what can happen if you have statements and expressions together is that you call an expression like a statement. So you forget to use the return value because it's allowed. Compiler won't complain about it. And yeah, we had some bugs in our C sharp course because we forget to use. The return value. This happens especially when you refactor a void method into a method that returns a value. So you have to look up all the usages, the compiler doesn't complain. I can rewrite that in C sharp as an expression by using the ternary operator. Um, yeah, it's much shorter, but that's not the main point. The main point is that now I can extract the whole branch, the 42, because that's an expression. Um, there is no side effect because just evaluation and then returning a value. Okay, yeah, I can call compute in the wrong way still because C sharp allows statements. If I use F sharp, the same code would look like this compute takes a value B, and if B, then 42, else 70. So there is no ternary operator. The if then else is the ternary operator, if you, if you like. So. A special case for completeness is if you have a function that doesn't take a value or don't want to return a value, you can use the unit value. It's something like void in C sharp, not exactly because it really is a value. So this compute tick doesn't take a value and it doesn't return a value. If you have a function that returns a value, but you're not interested in its return value, there is a special function called ignore that you can call. So this is the pipe operator. We will see that later again. It calls compute with true and then ignores the return value. So the compiler doesn't complain that we ignore it. So to sum this segment up is um, you can't ignore return values by accident. And that helps us to reduce the defects. We had that especially when we introduced async await in our code base, um, because when you started, there was no async await. So we had to introduce it later. And you can not await methods in C sharp if the containing method isn't marked as async. So compiler allows that. And that's, that are some nasty bugs to find. And again, if you only have expressions, it makes simpler. Uh, it makes refactoring a bit simpler. The compiler can help you better. <clears throat> now, bar, uh, bar, now a word about records. 
it's already a long day for me, so excuse me, please. Um, if I have a racket A, that's C-sharp 9, I think, from C-sharp 9, you have rackets. I have two options. Well, actually, I have four options, how I want to declare records, but these are the two options that result in an immutable record. And both have a name and an ID. And the one I call the constructor style syntax, and the other is the property style syntax. I don't know if they have official names, they're just my names. And if I want to instantiate, yeah, I have to know how they are declared because I have to use a different syntax depending on how they are declared. And that's really tedious if you have to change how they are declared from one way to the other because you have to change all the instantiations in your code. I think that's just silly. In uh, F sharp, if you have a record, uh, A is a record, it just uh, you declare the properties. You can write it in on multiple lines or on a single line. If you write it on a single line, you have to add a semicolon between the fields or between the properties. And But there is just one way how you instantiate a record. Falling to records is in F sharp, equality is for free. So if you look at this record data here, which takes name and an array of values, and I instantiate A and B with the same values in it, and I compare them. What is the return value? What do you think? Does it return true or false? Write it in the chat or unmute your mic. Sebastian says it returns false, that's correct, because uh, the arrays are compared by reference. These are reference types. And yeah, that's not really what I would expect, but that's how C Sharp works. And if you want to compare these two records, you really have to implement their equality methods and the get hash code method on the data record. In F sharp, I have also a record called data with a name and values of string array. I again have A and B with the same values and in F sharp, this returns true because in F sharp, all the F sharp types implement deep equality. That means arrays, lists, all have deep equality. Of course, if you use a C sharp type from F sharp, then they are compared like reference types as well. But typically, if you write F sharp code, you stay in the F sharp type system. And then everything is deep equal. That's really nice. Because in our C sharp code, we like link queue because it makes a lot of data crunching uh, very easy. But link queue uses a lot of equality behind the scenes. When you have contains, contains key, a dictionary lookup, group by union distinct, they all use equality. So equality is really important in C-sharp. So if you use things with link you probably should implement correct equality. And yeah, that's a lot of work. Or you use some uh, weaver that weaves the quality code into your um, code base, but takes time during compilation, which slows down the TDD cycle. So it's just nice that F-sharp provides that out of the box. Then we have something in F-sharp that you don't have in C-sharp. And these are types that say it's this or that and nothing else. So if I want to model a temperature in C-sharp, I probably would use an, an interface at temperature. And let's say I have two implementations, Celsius and Fahrenheit. And for the fun of it, Celsius has a double and Fahrenheit has an int. I know Fahrenheit is not Per definition in is just for the sample. So in F sharp, I can use a discriminated union. So that's one of the quite easy words from the functional uh, people. It's discriminated union. It says temperature is either Celsius or it's Fahrenheit. So on the left in C sharp, this is an open type hierarchy. So we can add additional temperatures. I could add Kelvin with a new implementation. On the right side, there's a closed hierarchy because there is no further 
possibility. If I want to add Kelvin, I have to change this code. Then we can use this definition. So I like it when it's warm. So for me, warm means above 25 degrees Celsius or 77 degrees Fahrenheit. And it's a switch statement on the left in C sharp. It's the same code on the right for F sharp with a match. That's really the same code. There is really no difference. It's just the fancy uh, syntax from C sharp nine on the left side, which I don't like, but that's just personal preference. Then for something like this, I want to get the measure of the temperature. So I want to know whether it's Celsius or Fahrenheit. I can use pattern matching again. But here I have the problem that I have to add a third case, the else case. And I don't know what to do there because there is actually no third case, but it's an open type error key. So it is possible for the compiler. So we typically add some throw new exception. And this should never happen. In F sharp, because the compiler knows there are exactly two options, um, the compiler can help me and say, yeah, this pattern match is complete. There is no other cases. This also works when you have uh, conditionals and so on. And when we want to add, for example, Kelvin, I can add Kelvin to the union type and the compiler will complain that this match is not complete. So it's really easy to add something and find all the pattern matching uh, matches, match with that are that I have to change to make this refactoring complete. So maybe some of you say, yeah, 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 but that's stupid because the example on the left side, that's not OO. Because in OO, we would clearly add a method get measure to the eye temperature interface. And then the result would be, if I add Kelvin, I have to implement this method. So I, I can't forget it. And that's absolutely true. That's the way to go actually in C-sharp. But my experience is that a lot of C-sharp developers really like these switch expressions and use them a lot. So in practice, yeah, you should probably model it with an OO pattern and you add a method to our temperature. But a lot of devs don't do this because don't ask me why, I just see a lot of code that is written in this style. And another thing is with OO, in my experience, so I have 20 years of experience in C-sharp, so it is really, really hard to maintain a good OO design over many years in a system. Because at the heart of OO is you have a state that you encapsulate in an object and everything that has to know this state has to go into the same object, the same class. So they tend to grow bigger and bigger and bigger. And that's a problem, it's something that doesn't happen, happen with pattern matching. So that's maybe a reason why a lot of developers like to add stuff with pattern matching instead of real OO design. But it leads to the problem that you have these else cases that when you add the case are probably haunting you. Then pattern matching in F-sharp goes a step further and introduces so-called active patterns. It's just uh, pattern matching on steroid because I can define uh, so-called cases. I can say it is warm when this or this is happening or is this cold otherwise. So if it, I say here, it is warm and it's Celsius and above 25 degree or it's Fahrenheit and above 77, then it's warm, otherwise it's cold. And I can use that to make pattern matches um, much easier uh, to, uh, to match, to read. So the code is easier to read, could say match temperature if is warm, is cold. And there is a lot to, uh, to these active patterns. And here's a link for you to, if you find that interesting. So I see we have some questions in the chat. What will F-sharp match? To if I query Ichi Kelvin. So for an unknown value, you can't do that because temperature can 
here temperature can only be Celsius or Fahrenheit. It can't be anything else. It's not possible. Because uh, you can only use the, the types that are uh, defined here. It has to be Celsius or Fahrenheit. It won't come. Yeah, you can't write Kelvin there. And Dominic asks, what do you mean by query Kelvin? I can't remember what I said, but I think it's when I add the case Kelvin, so I would add a new case here, uh, a new implementation on the left or a new case on the right side. Um, then it would fall here in the else statement and would throw an exception. Ah, oh, okay. Of course, I think he was just uh, trying to ask to Sebastian about his question. Ah, oh, okay. Yeah, meta questions are about me. So. <laughs> Yep. So the whole point of uh, this additional tool we have in F Sharp is that it makes modeling a domain much easier. I just don't have classes and interface. I have records and these union types. And my experience, it's we have in our domains, we have a lot of things. It's either A or B or nothing else. That happens a lot. So if you have credit card, you have uh, MasterCard, Visa, American Express, and that's it, because we Oops. can't have anything else. Question, then uh, using F-sharp would be really great to, to map a bit the domain rules, right? And then I don't know if that would be good to, to put and combine that with the other C-sharp classes. Is, is that the best usage for, for F-sharp then? Um, I would delay the the question, when should we use what to the end? Okay. So here it's just, we have more tools to model our domain. And with these union types, it gets quite easy to have a model that doesn't allow illegal state. So when I have an interface, I temperature, I could possibly have I, uh, a Kelvin implementation. I don't know that. And that's not possible with union types. So it makes code uh, much more straightforward. But you have to do it to really experience it, to see that. I know I didn't believe it when I was writing C Sharp. So just have to take my word for it. So the next topic is that left to right, top to bottom, because that's the way I like to read text. If I read a, a book, I'll, I read it from left to right, from top to bottom. And here, a small sample. And again, it's really small sample, so the code doesn't make that much sense, but it's to show you a point. I have a customer with a name, and I have a method to get the customer, and it's just a fake. It just returns Charles for every ID you pass to it. I have a method to get the name of the customer. So that stands there for some business logic, and it's a really simple business logic here. And I want to combine that. So I want to get the name of a customer by its ID. And one way to write it in C Sharp is, of course, give me the name, but first give me the customer with this ID. So actually, it reads from the inside out. And if you have a couple of things that you have to nest, it gets really ugly. So what do we do? We introduce some local variables. So a vari variable customer that you can assign, so the code gets a bit easier to read. But there are a lot of customers in these three lines of code, so it's a, a lot of noise for me. When you compare that to F Sharp, I have a customer with a name. Again, I have a load customer by its side, we just return Charles, and get name of customer, just returns the name. And in F Sharp, you have the pipe operator to make such things much easier to read. So you can read it from left to right, from top to bottom. So I start with an identifier. I pass that to load customer. So the pipe operator just takes the value from the front and adds it at the end, like pipe in the console. So with the ID, I load the customer, then I get the customer, and then this customer is passed to get name of customer and the result is returned. 
So if you want to add something at the end, you can just add and add and add and add. Dux makes code um, way easier to read, at least for me, than C sharp code. Um, for completeness, if you use this get name of customer from ID a lot, you can define that it's a combination of the two function load customer and get name of customer. You can do that, but actually, in our code base of two years of writing F sharp, we maybe have three places where we use this operator. So it's not that important. The main point here is that with this pipe and function composition operator, it's really easy to combine existing functions into bigger functions. It's much easier to combine these functions than to combine methods and classes because you always have to deal with the state in these classes. So just combining functions is really easy. And I think it also makes code a little bit easier to read and understand because it's from left to right, from top to bottom. So before we go to the next example, we have to do some basics. <clears throat> asynchronous programming, you probably know that from C sharp. Here's a method asynchronous, I can pass in an ID and it returns asynchronously. So it returns a task of integer. And yes, the compiler will complain that there is no await in this async method, but normally there would be some IO call, some database call or file system call. For simplicity, it just adds one to the ID. So the example is extremely simple, but it compiles. That's the important part. And if I want to call this asynchronous method, you know that I can use async await. So I say the result is await this asynchronous call. And you probably should add configure await false, but nowadays it depends on the runtime you're running or the host you are in whether you have to use configure await false or not. If you want to be on the safe side, you should. So I get the R and the await unpacks the result because the result is a task of int. So the await unpacks this int and assigns it to R. So R is an int, so I can add 17. So at the end, the only thing I did is I added 18 to the ID. The same thing in F sharp and there are two ways to do asynchronicity nowadays in F sharp, and the default is use async. It's an asynchronous method that adds as well one to the ID. And this, this thing here, another word I said I wouldn't use, but it's a computation expression. Um, just take it for now. It's really easy to use. The important is here that this asynchronous function, it takes an integer and returns an async of int. Think of it like the task of int. It's more or less the same thing. The difference is the task is always hot. When you, when you create a task, it will immediately run. Async is cold. When you have an async, you have to say when you want to run. If, if I want to call this asynchronous function, um, it's quite the same as in the C-sharp example, but the syntax is a little bit different. Instead of the await, I have a let bang. So it says let bang r is the result of asynchronous. And again, like in the case of the task, this let bang calls asynchronous and unwraps the value, the int into r. So r again is named or not an async of int. It's really the same as on the left side with C-sharp. So the await is in the bank. So that's the magic here. And one thing that is nice uh, compared in F-sharp to C-sharp, if you want to chain things that are awaitable in C-sharp, you have to use a lot of parentheses because you have to await asynchronous Write parentheses around that, then you can use dot something. And you don't have to do that in F sharp, you can pipe. Just use the pipe and continue doing stuff. If you really want to work with task in uh, F sharp, oh, I knew I had a, an error in my slides, and the, this slide is the one with the error. And nowadays, task is 
out of the box in F sharp, you can use it just replace the word async with task and you are working with tasks in F sharp. And as I said, nowadays tasks in F sharp are almost as fast as tasks in C sharp. I think they are not exactly the same speed, but almost. Uh, before F sharp five, you had to use additional libraries to work with tasks directly. So that was about asynchronicity. And we have a lot of optional values in our system. So things that are there or are not there. So another silly example here, we have a, a method optional that takes an, in, an ID, an integer, and in C sharp, I can have model things like I have a value or don't have a value with nullable, nullable ints. And I say, if ID is even, I have an ID. And if it's odd, I say, I don't have a value, so I'm use null. The same in F sharp, there is a built-in optional type, or the option, the name is option. Let's say this optional, this function called optional takes an ID. Again, if it's even, I say I have a value, some ID, otherwise I have none. As instead of null, I have none. And if there is a value, I have some. So that's a, a union type. And so that means in F sharp, as long as I'm still in the F sharp type system, I don't have to deal with nulls. I just use option and the compiler enforces me that I have to deal with these optional values. It's somewhat like uh, nullable reference types in C sharp, but it works in all cases. If I want to maybe add 17 to an optional value, I could write it like this. I say, okay, I take an ID, I call a function, the optional function, which returns an optional int, and I unpack that into R, if it is some value, and then I can continue. And if optional returns none, the whole optional plus 17 will immediately uh, return none. So it only continues as long as we have a value. <clears throat> Next step is we don't only, don't, have, don't only have an optional value, but we have a result value. So we execute something, and if it's successful, we have a result or we have an error if it's not successful. Again, I tried to model that with basics plain C sharp, and I here use a tuple with a nullable int and a nullable string. So the int is the result, the string is the error. Again, if it's even, I say I return the ID as a result. Otherwise, I say, no, that's an error, that's an odd number, I can't continue. Same in F sharp is, get result, I say, if it's even, then I say, it's okay. It's an okay, it went well. Otherwise I say, it's an error, odd number. Again, if I have to work with these uh, result types, I can use a computation expression that says, uh, call get result with an ID. And if it's okay, then we continue, then we add 17. If there is an error, we stop immediately and return the error. So if you have multiple calls to functions return results, you just stop at the first error and you get through the whole function if everything goes well. At the end, you can match on the result. You could say, okay, I executed that. Now I want to know if it was okay. So I match the result with okay value, continue with the good case, or I match it with error and then something went wrong. So now we are ready for the next example, the happy path code. I have a little challenge for us. So I have a model, I have a customer with an optional name, and I have, I have a data with an amount. And we have to implement some code and we get a customer ID and a data ID. Then we have to load, we have to load the customer, which may exist or not. We have to load data. Then if we found the customer, we have to get the name of the customer, but that's an optional name. So if there is no name, again, we have a problem. Then we get the amount of the data if it was found. And if everything 
was successful, we return a tuple with the name and the amount. If anything went wrong, we just return some kind of error. So that's things we have a hundred times in our code. The client sends us some data. We assemble the data from the database. It may be there or it's, it's maybe deleted already. And we have to handle all these cases. It's a typical use case in our code base. So on the left again, C sharp, on the right, F sharp. I have to use some records. And some fun fact, it's the only slide where the C sharp code is shorter than the F sharp code. Um, I have a customer with a ID and optional name. I have data with ID and amount, quite easy. I have a faked method to load customer. I just say, if it's 42, we return Charles. Otherwise we say, we didn't find the customer, just a fake. The same uh, in F-sharp, and actually that's also short in, uh, in C-sharp, but the reason is I do a little bit more in F-sharp here, because I say, okay, yeah, you pass me a customer ID and I compare it with 42. And I say, this has to be true, otherwise we have an error. And the error is customer not found. So the async result computation expression will only continue when the customer ID is 42. If it's not, this function will return an error with the value customer not found. And if we get over this check, some rudimentary validation here, I return a customer. That will be the okay with the customer value. If I would call this, I could call load customer 42 and pattern match on the result. Um, for 42, it would be okay. For any other int, it would be error. Then you have to load the data. And here we just return some data to make it a little bit simpler. Then you have to implement the get name of customer method and function. And because the name on the customer is already optional, we can just return that. Uh, again, if I want to work with optional values, you have seen that I can use the option computation expression to maybe trim the name or something. Then you want to combine everything together in the get customer name and amount method. So, and first I try to load the customer. And please remember that can be null. So I have to check whether it's null because then you have an error case and I modeled the error case in the C sharp code by returning no. Then you load the data again. If you can't load the data, return null. Then I want to get the name of the customer, which could be null again. So I return null. And if it gets down there, everything went well, and I can return the tuple with name and the amount. So now the F sharp equivalent. I want to load the customer and load customer returns a result. And because I'm in an async result computation expression and I write let bang, it tries to unwrap the result into the customer. So if load customer returns an error, it's like the early return in the C-sharp code, it won't continue. So that's the magic here. Then I try to load the data. Again, if it fails, the whole expression returns error. And then I get the name of the customer, which is, which is, a, which is a optional value. So to map, map the option value to result to say that we require some value here. So of course. Can, yeah. We have a question from David. Yeah, I, will let, I will answer it after the slide. Okay. Thanks. So say, just continue when we really have a name. Otherwise say, customer has the name. And then at the end, when you get here, I can return again the tuple with name and the amount. So, and this was the, the kind of code with which I convinced my team to switch to F sharp, because this is code that is really typical for our system. And 
let's be honest, we didn't write all this if customer equals null return null code in our C-sharp code because it's just way too noisy. We used exceptions and exceptions for things that can happen are really ugly and hard to tell which is a real exception, which is just we were too, uh, we didn't want to write the real uh, error handling code. So the code on the right, the F sharp code, uh, reads reads much easier because yeah, load customer, load data, get the name, return the data. If you are used to the F sharp syntax, it reads really really well. So and to make the uh, the example complete, <coughs> we call this method and return on the result value whether it's error. In the case of C-sharp, it's null. Uh, we, we write it was an error. Otherwise, we continue with some code. So these uh, computation expressions, they're really great because they hide a lot of things you have to do all the time. Like it hides how we have to do with asyncs, how we have to handle errors and much more. There are uh, a lot of these computation expressions. And the nice thing is you can write your own. It's not that easy, but you can write your own. There are also a lot of libraries that provide uh, many of these computation expressions, for example, for validation and so on. And they conceptually, they work all the same. So that's a bit of difference between F sharp and C sharp. In C sharp, has a, C sharp has a solution for async await, and it only works for async await. In F sharp, the same concept that works for async also works for options, results, validation, queries to a database, and so on. So we have to learn a lot of learn. You have to learn a lot less concepts in F sharp than in C sharp. And again, these computation expressions we use them all the time because it makes code much more easy to read, understand, and they are also quite easy to write. So that's is about syntax and features. But I want to mention some other things as well when you compare our C sharp experience with, with our F sharp experience. Um, I think there should be some kind of coding convention in a team because I want to be able to read the code from my colleagues. That the code should look more or less the same. So therefore, in C-sharp, there is a tool called StyleCop or some linter. And they spot all the mistakes you made and say, hey, you made a mistake, correct this. And yeah, that's a lot of manual work to correct all the spaces that are wrong or everything that violates your coding convention. So we disabled a lot of rules, but still StyleCop finds a lot of things we have to manually fix. So in F sharp, there is a tool called Phantomos. You just execute Phantomos and it layouts your code according to your coding convention. So there's the manual work is pressing a shortcut and the code is formatted as it should be. I know in ReSharp or Writer, you can do something like this for C sharp code, but I never got the rules correct so that the code looks lovely. Uh, it's much easier if Phantom as an F shop. And yeah, it's fully automatic. Then uh, something that I hear a lot when you when I introduce F sharp or talk about F sharp is also, yeah, but F sharp, that's that's a pain because everything has to be ordered in F sharp. Uh, when you are in C sharp, there is no ordering. You can as order your files, structure your files as you want. There is no order in the solution. The problem with that is it's really easy to introduce cycles in your design, namespaces, cycles in namespaces, cycles in classes. And this is a problem for refactoring. If you have a cycle, it's hard because when you want to refactor something, you don't have a start and an end because everything depend, depends on everything in a cycle. So we used to use additional tooling that said, hey, there is a cycle. Please eliminate the cycle so the code is easy to maintain. And yeah, in F sharp, everything has to be strictly ordered. So a function can only use what is 
defined above. Also in the solution, a file can only use what is defined in the files above. And at first, this is a little bit of pain, but you, I got used to it rather quickly. And from then on, it's just a good thing because the compiler doesn't allow you to make big cycles. So we can have little cycles when you have, for example, a recursive data structure like a tree where two types have to know each other, a node and a leaf in a tree, but they have to be adjacent. Otherwise, no cycles are possible. And from an architect's point of view, that's a great feature of a language. And it also makes code easier to understand because when I read a function, I know everything that this function can use is above. So if I have to look for something I don't understand, I at least know the direction I have to look. In C sharp, it could be anywhere. Then type inference. Um, so the compiler, I don't have to write the type. The compiler doesn't know, uh, the compiler does know from the code itself. And we have that in C sharp too. For example, the var keyword or the from C sharp 9, I guess it's the new, new uh, the constructor call without specifying the type. Or when you use link, use link queue, there is a lot of type inference going on. Also, we have the default keyword. You can say some variable equals default. And if the compiler knows, you don't have to write default of int or default of string. In F sharp, there is a lot more type inference. The present, it's for values, functions, and even generics, which is really nice. So working with generics in F sharp is much less typing than working with generics in C-sharp. It also makes refactoring much easier because you can change the return type of a function and will, it will bubble through your solution until the compiler finds a spot where it doesn't compile anymore. But there is a but to it. Sometimes uh, writing code gets a little bit trickier because uh, you and your compiler don't agree on the type that should be used here. And sometimes the error messages can get confusing. So it's a good idea to add some type annotations uh, in this situation until you and your compiler figure out who is wrong. Sadly, no, normally it's me and not the compiler. <laughs> so um, experience after, yeah, I should update this slide. It's may it's more like 22 months now. Um, I think it's much easier to model a domain model precisely in F sharp because you have discriminated units. So I can say it's Celsius or Fahrenheit, nothing else. That helps a lot. And with this uh, computation expression, as we have seen. It's really easy to write focused code that focus on the intent of the business flow here. And we don't have to worry too much about wiring, handling errors and so on. But errors are all handled, handled really nice here. There are no exceptions, just returning errors if something goes wrong. So to sum up, when we compare our C-sharp code and our F-sharp code, I think our F sharp code is much easier to read and understand than our C sharp code. That's because of this computation expressions and the union types. Code is simpler to refactor because we annotate a lot, almost no types. So we don't have to deal that much with types if we refactor them. We have strict ordering, so no cycles. Again, union types help because the compiler says, yeah, you just added a union case, an additional option, and you have, to de you have to handle that. And because everything is in expressions, there are no statements. Expressions are just easier to reflect than statements. And we had very few bugs in our C-sharp code, but we think our F-sharp code, sometimes in the code reviews, just you look at the code, yeah, this code is so obviously bug-free. Um, it just is fun to work with F sharp. And here again, the, because everything is expression and the type system is really, really great in F sharp. So that's it for me.
for why I think that you should take a look at F sharp to make your easy, your life a little bit easier. So, oh, I, for, I forget, to, I forgot the question. Will it compile <laughs> without the bang? Oh, I forgot that, sorry. Uh, it was this yeah, here. Yep. Um, <clears throat> No, it won't compile without the bang. But I could, I could write the line let bang customer without the bang. Then the type of customer would change. Now it's just customer is of type customer. If I delete the bang, then it would be of async of customer. So I could write code without the bang, but then I would have to deal with the with another type. That's possible, but normally you want to uh, push this async thing into the computation expression. So you don't have to handle it explicitly in your code. So it's like in, uh, in the, on the C-sharp side, you can delete the await, but then your customer is of type task of customer and not only customer. I hope that clears the question up. David? Right. Oh, sorry. Yes, that's, uh, uh, thank you. That uh, was what I meant. You have to deal with the task type in the further code. I have a new question. I'm doing some Haskell next to my C-sharp in Java and F-sharp is obviously similar. My question and strong concern is all the new not obvious things in the language and the magic you <laughs> kept mentioning. Not obvious, oh thanks. Um, I have to return the question, what is not obvious? And I just said magic because the bang is like magic when you see it the first time. When you know how these computation expressions are implemented, it's not magic at all. It's just all functions. Yeah, that means, can you hear me? You say it. Yes, I hear you. Hi, super, thanks. No, it's very interesting, words. thanks for the presentation. As I said, I'm doing some Haskell more in the kind of blockchain world, but I learned Haskell and I had a hard time learning it just because the paradigm is so different and so on. But that is, you know, something which we can learn. I think the the my thing, what I think you and I will learn from C sharp Java stuff is, you know, when you want to scale these languages to larger teams and larger groups, I find it much, I, or the, historically I found much easier when there is no special learning, special syntax required, and at least in maybe F sharp is not so much, but has there's so much extra syntax required that I fear if I have three people, sure, seven people, sure, 20 people, I will never get them to understand the same way what is meant by a let with exclamation mark and a greater than, y with a greater than, and so on and so forth. Again, this is in the context, if they are brand new people, then point taken, but people who have done a Java or a C sharp before coming in, I just, uh, kept feeling that it's just a huge learning curve, and uh, uh, and the and and just to finish my question on the second part. I saw the uh, things about the expressions and the pattern matching, and I buy kind of your point that a struct is a useful new modeling structure to be able to have. Uh, I feel that if I am doing oh, oh, it's often easier for me to review my colleagues is oh programming and then we don't have to worry about which case statement and switch statement is better implemented because I would say we should not be needing those at all. That's just my thoughts. Happy to hear what you think. Okay. Um, I, I can totally understand your point. And uh, this is the way when you come from C sharp or Java. But my point is actually there are a lot less concepts in F sharp than there are in C sharp. So if you if you have to learn your first programming language, learning C sharp is in my opinion way harder than learning F sharp. 
Um, in C sharp, you have C sharp nine and ten. Got the, brought a lot of new operators for nullability, and yeah, they are really not easy. And yeah, of course, in F sharp there are some new concepts if you come from C sharp or Java, but the same would be true if you. You know F sharp and go to C sharp. You also would have to allow, to learn a lot of concept like async await. So, yeah, it's always easier to do the thing you already know. That's for sure. <laughs> but what one thing is the the bang here. There are not many places in F sharp where you use a bang. For example, not equal is not bang equal. It's smaller than greater than. Mm -hmm. So what I like about F sharp is when you have a keyword or an operator, it's almost used exclusively used for the one use case, not for many use cases like the exclamation mark in C sharp, which is used in nullability or not equal. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, but if your background is Java, of course, C sharp is much closer to Java than F sharp is to uh, is to Java. But F sharp is really close to all the ML languages like Haskell or Camel. That is true. No, but thank you. Thanks, Kev. And uh, this afternoon, I ask my work colleague, um, "How long did you take to learn F sharp?" And he answered, two weeks." Mm -hmm. So it can't be that hard. But his background war, was, of course, C-sharp. He knew JavaScript, TypeScript. And you can apply a lot of TypeScript patterns to F-sharp because mm -hmm. TypeScript JavaScript is some hybrid between, uh, I don't know what paradigms this actually is, but there are a lot of functional faults in JavaScript as well. Yeah, no, I, I hear you. I, I'm trying hard to get to be comfortable with this. It's, it takes more than two weeks to me to get comfortable with F sharp after doing C sharp for so long, I guess. Yeah, so, yeah. <laughs> I probably showed you all the concepts yeah. tonight, mm -hmm. which you have to know. So yeah, of course, you have to do some exercises. There are some great F sharp courses. There is exorcism, for example, to uh, to do some exercises online. So of course it takes learning, sure. but the, I would say the learning curve is not that high. And what's important is don't solve mathematical exercises. That's very important. <laughs> solve exercises like ordinary day programming because all these mathematical examples, they are really condensed as if it's a challenge to take as least as little as uh, as few characters as possible, and they condense everything in a fold left. So uh, <laughs> there are not that many fold lefts in business codes. So. All right, gentlemen, I think we are a bit out of time. And if there is any further questions, we may uh, reach them after the talk from um, Simon, if if that's all right for you, of course. I think uh, we should give him the word. Uh, and after that, the speakers will be here to respond to any question like some recommendations on what, uh, where to learn, some recommendations, and as well, yeah, some wild west of programming. Okay. <laughs> and also some mention with Christian Barr. But I would I would say that we go for these questions at the end, if that's all right for everybody. Yes, nobody says anything. So Simon, okay. well, first of all, Urs, thank you very much. That was a fantastic session. You managed to do that without too much technicism. So thank you very much. That was really cool. And hope to get some nice discussion at the end. Simon? Hey. Fingers crossed, it's actually going to work properly. <clears throat> just hit them, just, just my microphone. Looks good so far. That's better. Ken, are you still seeing that screen sharing weirdness because like before? It looks fantastic. No weird things. Okay, good. We do not like weird things getting in the way. Uh, 
I already have my boss at work. I leave. He, he's the only weird thing I allow in my in my work. Oh, I'm being mean to him. Oh, sorry. Right, let's go. Let's go. Let's go. Oh. Okay, functional C sharp. I am probably going to be letting everyone down terribly after Oz's fantastic talk on F sharp. Caveat: I am not an F sharp developer. I know like tiny, tiny, tiny bit of F sharp. Nevertheless, I will opine on F sharp at some point, most likely. Apologies in advance to anyone. Um, I'll bring this back up um, later. If anyone's interested, these are ways to reach out to me. I have a Twitter handle. Uh, I have a website where I mean, I've started trying to get myself to maintain a blog. I mostly talk about functional programming, funnily enough, and the project source code's up there on GitHub as well, but I am pretty easy to reach if you care to. Uh, I should probably put my LinkedIn come to think of it there. Uh, I, apologies, also, I have a funny accent. You may have noticed. I'm afraid it doesn't scrub out. That's just how I sound. So if I don't make sense to anyone, please feel free to reach out and uh, on the chat or on the audio, just ask me to explain what the heck I just said. Um, right, let's go. Also, I speak German and French if that is any easier for anyone for asking questions. A little bit about me. I'll just skid through this quickly. Uh, I've worked in an awful lot of places. Been doing this for nigh on 16 years, I think. Uh, I've worked for an awful lot of different departments. I've worked for uh, some government contracting places. I've done laboratories. I have done manufacturing. Uh, I've worked for a gigantic bookshop firm here in the UK, which is great because I love books. I was briefly one of those contractors your mum used to warn you about when you were little. Uh, these days, I work for Müller Dairies. I do not know if they're well known in Switzerland or no, um, but they're certainly well known here in the UK by reason of they do rather, rather excellent yogurts. Uh, Muller Corners, they're very nice. I'm not just saying that because I work for them. A bit, but <laughs> they are nice. Uh, okay. You discourage the use of German except for jokes. Ach, nein. Right. <laughs> uh i i uh, i love german. german is one of my favorite languages but anyway so i like films films is one of my favorite things so i am going to have a program of events rather than um uh rather than an itinerary or whatever and i'm going to go with the slightly inaccurately named six w's uh who what where when why and how notice the entirely deliberate mistake there so this is the, the facets of functional programming. They'll be a little disproportionately sized because first we're going to whip through the first five and then most of it is going to be on the rest. Now, I'm assuming relatively zero knowledge of functional programming. So I don't know if that's reasonable or no. I know we've just had Urs's, uh, his talk. Uh, I'm assuming slightly less knowledge and I don't know. I, it's hard for me to gauge not, not seeing your, your most uh, so many of your lovely faces as to how, uh, how confused everyone's getting. But if I am taking it far too simple, then just budge me along and I'll uh, skip a few slides. Who? Let's start with who. So three people from history who are uh, fundamental to the history of functional programming. One of these guys is a software developer. See if you can guess him when he comes around. Uh, this gentleman is Alonzo Church. In the 1950s, he wrote a load of mathematical papers. Not going to pretend I understood any of them. I don't. I am not a mathematician. I like maths. Maths is cool. Uh, and this is what I tell my daughter, so I'd best believe it. Um, but the reason this gentleman is uh, important, he came up with something he, well, he didn't come up with exactly, but he helped develop something called, I believe it was combinatory logic, which is kind of one of the things that underpins functional programming. And uh, does my mouse actually show up? Can you see I see my mouse? Yay. Yeah, you see this lot down here? Yes. Yay. Yeah, you see this lot down here? This is something that still has resonance today. This is something of his, I believe. And this is an arrow function. There it is. See, there's the arrow. And this guy here, this donates a parameter into our arrow function. That's the Greek letter lambda, hence lambda expression, because of him. This gentleman is Haskell Curry. About the same time, has no fewer than three programming name languages named after him. No prizes for guessing that one of them is Haskell, but uh, <laughs> it is. I think one of them's Curry. I can't remember what the other one is. I think it's from his middle name, uh, which I cannot remember. He is the guy that came up with, amongst many other amazing things, I am sure, this galot here. That's currying. I'm not going to go into that right now. Don't worry about it. But it is a functional thing. So once again, old guy from the 50s, mathematics, yes. 
could this guy be a software developer? He is. Look at that beard. Yes, uh, this is John McCarthy. He came up with what is arguably the very first functional programming language in the 1960s. Lisp. That's a bit on the side. Don't ask me what that does. I do not know. But the point is that it was in the 60s that this stuff started. Thanks, Tim. I'm told Lisp still has its fans. I have no idea. It could be. I've heard you could do some really wild things with it. Apparently, innumerables have got nothing on what you could do in Lisp. But I don't know. I'm a C-sharp developer. That's what I do. So what is functional programming not? It's not new. And that was the point of the last few slides. It is not new. It is not the latest trendy JavaScript framework. It is not whatever. You know, it is is not a thing that is here today, gone tomorrow. My point is, it's been around a long time. In fact, I did once embark on an absolute fool's errand of attempting to find out the origins of the various papers of maths that uh, became functional programming. It goes all the way back to the late 1800s, and I can't understand any of it. Another caveat, I am not a mathematician. As I say, I am an engineer. And so what I'm interested in is what does it do? How do I do it? What's it for? That sort of stuff. That's what I'm mostly going to focus on. But it is not a new thing. My point being, even if you pick these skills up in C Sharp, not useless. Even if, for example, C Sharp weren't a thing in five years, I've no, I, I think it'll still be a thing. But if it weren't, still not useless. This stuff's been around for ages. It is not a language. It's a paradigm. A paradigm is a style of programming. So, for example, I could pick up a guitar and I could play country and rock, uh, country and western music if if I had absolutely no taste. I could play rock music. I could play pop. Whatever. The point is, I could play many styles of music on the same instrument. Thus, also in many programming languages, you can program in many styles, and functional programming is one such. Strictly speaking, it belongs to a family of styles of programming called declarative rather than object orientated, which is procedural. Uh, I could do a whole slide on that, not going to. If anyone's interested, ask me afterwards. Um, it is not imperative or object orientated. A lot of the skills and ideas you picked up in object orientated not really gonna help you in functional. Sorry, that's the way it is. It is not the solution to all of your problems. I would argue it's the solution to many. Won't solve everything though. You still have to make your own coffee, nor is it difficult. I have had done this talk a lot of times to a lot of places, and funnily enough, some of the people that come up the most enthusiastic about functional are often university students, fresh out of university, haven't got the background in object orientation like the rest of us have probably got. I've been doing OO since, eesh, we're probably talking like year 2002, something like that, that I've been looking at it, so I'm pretty embedded, but folks that aren't don't tend to find it quite so hard. So what is it? What actually does it comprise of? I don't know whether this is all going to be totally news to you guys or not, but fair enough. If, if anyone at any point is finding this tedious, just say and I'll skip. So the various properties of the functional paradigm. Immutability. That is, once a variable has been set, it may not be changed ever at all. Consider all variables to be const. Okay, great. Someone says don't skip. Oh, that means I get to talk more. I like it. I like it. Thank you, Marco. Right, immutability. Do not ever change a variable once set. Basically, you end up writing code that looks rather like mathematical working. Um, it's no coincidence, I suspect, that uh, F sharp uses the let keyword. That's a maths thing. Let blah equal blah. Uh, I, I've seen my old, my dad did actually do a degree in maths, and I've seen his working. It's pretty much what it looked like. Higher order functions. Scary phrase, simple idea. Functions passed around like variables. That's it either as the return out of a value out of a function or as the parameter into a function. If you have seen func of t, that, that's what it is. There's a bit more to it, but that's basically it. Functions, not statements. This is an important one. What it means is statements. What's a statement? That would be if, for, or each, all those things which have changed the structure of your code and changed the order of operations, whether we flip uh, this way or that way, whether we're going to go around again, anything like that, that's a statement. Functional programming don't have them. So the ideal is to eliminate all of them from our code to the maximum amount possible. There's always going to be some trade-offs, but generally speaking, that's the aim. 
at least in the C-sharp world. Uh, referential transparency. Once again, scary term, simple idea. Right. Also known as pure functions, functional tra the referential transparency. What it means is a given function, given the same parameters, will always return the same result. So uh, the ultimate example would be an add. Let's say that I give it five and three, it will always give eight. It's never going to give nine randomly for no reason at all. That's a pure function. Referential transparency, I believe, comes from the idea that you can switch out the function for the value um, that you that results from it. Something like that. It may not rely on anything from outside of the function except for its own parameters. And nothing must ever affect the same result coming out, no matter what, no matter the state of the system, no matter the life of the universe, no matter. Recursion. I'm hoping everyone's fairly good on recursion. If you're not, going to be a tough night for you. Recursion, function calling itself. This is generally what functional programming does instead of looping. Uh, pattern recognition. We'll be going to that later. It's a it's a basically a switch statement with knobs on. Uh, anyone who's worked in C sharp eight, nine, and blood, so on may well have seen basically the Microsoft implementation of this concept. It's stateless. There is no state. The, you have immutable variables. So how are you going to update them with the state? There's other ways. There are other ways. I'll get into that a little. Monads. <laughs> Monads. This is the one that terrifies everyone. Uh, Douglas Crockford once said that the curse of the monad is the moment you gain the ability to understand it, you lose the ability to explain it. Therefore, I shall not. And it is not difficult. Hopefully you'll agree by the end of this. Otherwise, everyone's going to look a bit exhausted by the time I'm done. We'll see. So where is it? These are places you'll find it. There are, of course, the uh, functional languages, Haskell, Erlang, Elm. There are others. Heard it's all good stuff. I never worked in a single one of them. Uh, I know Haskell has its fans. Uh, Erlang does certainly get used in production. Apparently, Haskell has its uses out in the banking businesses. Um, I've heard of Elm. Elm is interesting because it has a lot of influence beyond just itself. Uh, React, React.js, if anyone's used that, is heavily influenced by the structures of Elm. In fact, React.js really is very much a functional uh, system, the way it's often used. JavaScript, there it is, JavaScript. The Wild West of Programming, as I've, I said earlier, pretty much supports any paradigm you get a name. And of course, it, it, uh, it supports functional very, very, very well. And c -sharp, which is why I'm here. So when is it? Let's not say it can't do other things, but when's it happiest? When is it actually the most useful? So data processing, that is, take data from this form into this form. Really good at that. Totally, utterly um, predictable code. We have dead easy for us to make the whole thing out of pure functions. Functional programming, happy as Larry here. Okay, concurrent systems. That is, having an awful lot of things running side by side, processing, I don't know, the same queue, or something, the same some source or there's some common element. The point is functional programming is stateless. The problems you tend to get from concurrent systems are often there's a shared state and you have resource contention. Generally doesn't happen in functional programming. Not to say that you can't get, I can hear a microphone kicking in, so I have a question. Nope, okie dokie. Right, um, so not to say that you can't still have emergent problems happening from complex systems, you completely can, but it's less of a problem. Serverless, so same sort of reason really. Serverless is happiest with no state. It, you tend to have serverless in the, well, the implementation in the Azure world is, um, oh gosh, what is it? Um, so there are functions or something, I believe it is. And I think it's called lambdas over in the AWS world. Uh, so same basic idea. You've got a whole load of them stacked up side by side running in parallel. Functional supports it well. So if you're going into microservices, if you're going into serverless. Oh, and high criticality. I missed that off because functional programming tends to be more uh, robust. You generally get fewer, if any, errors. I know it's the claim of some of the pure functional languages that once the thing compiles, you'll never be able to kill it. Like nothing will bring the system down once it's running. Might well be true, I can believe it. Might not necessarily be so easy in the C-sharp world because we're gonna to have to make some compromises here and there, but you get the idea. So if you want this thing to go up and stay up, if you wanna do a load of parallel processing, uh, anything like that, this is where functional is strongest. 
where is it not? Now, not to say that you can't do these things, because I know the F-sharp guys will absolutely belie everything I'm about to say. It totally can do UI. I know it can. I know F-sharp's got a whole load of libraries for doing UI, for doing web, but yes, uh, someone's just mentioned React. I did mention React earlier. Yes, React.js is functional programming generally, and yes, that is UI. So it's not that it can't, um, but it works on the basis, the idea of I try to make your system as pure as possible so that you want as few unexpected interactions as possible. The, the places where this is going to happen is where things are outside of your control. And one of those is, is the user. Uh, you know, there is nothing, absolutely nothing more impure than a human being from a computer's perspective. So any interactions with the users, we need to make a compromise. IO, same idea. You know, you, I can write the purest function possible but if someone goes and deletes that file, I was expected to be there the moment I expect it. Well, we can have an unexpected action happen. Any, any external interactions as web UIs, all the rest of it, same thing, out of our control, cannot be pure. We have to make a compromise. The metaphor that I usually use is, uh, I don't know whether everyone knows this, but there are actually two parts to a shadow. Actually, there are, I've done a drawing course, there's about 14, but there's uh, two main parts to, um, to a shadow. Okay, there's the umbra and the penumbra. I think it comes from Latin. So the umbra is the dark solid bit in the middle and the pen umbra is the fuzzy gray bit around the edge. The goal when writing functional code, at least in C-sharp, is to maximize the dark bit. That is the purely functional bit, the, the bit that's running without, inter uh, without uh, unexpected um, actions happening. And then to minimize the gray fuzzy bit around the outside where we have to interact with uh, other systems, with users, whatever. Um, I know that there are systems in place in the various other in the pure functional languages for wrapping up this stuff, but in the C sharp world, we don't necessarily have that uh, that benefit. Ah, so why? This is the bit to share with your boss if you're interested in functional. Why are we interested? It's concise, and I don't think that's a small thing. I think that's important. It is concise. It's small. It's easy to read because we spend an awful lot of time as developers staring at code and trying to work out what. The heck does this do? Uh, I don't know whether anyone else has had that experience. I have lots. And if it's nice and concise and easy to read, it's going to make my life easier. It's going to mean I can turn around changes for the business faster. So business saves money, win-win. And then same applies for readable. Now, extremely testable. This is a biggie for a lot of people. It is. It is incredibly, incredibly testable. If you are aiming for something close to 100% testable code base, Functional programming is the way forward. Absolutely, it is. And because we're basing this on the idea of these, these pure functions, that strongly supports the idea of testability. Because it's an awful lot easier to just sort of throw things into it and get a an answer back. Uh, concurrency, I've talked about before. It is robust. I've mentioned that before. And it's fun. I think it's fun. I think it puts some of the fun back in programming. Honestly, I do. So I've been doing it for the last four or five years. Right. First off, a bit of decidedly non-functional code. I still see this in my code base at work all the time. Uh, this is totally the old object orientated manner of doing something. Now you can't tell in a few seconds what this does, but uh, those of you who've done a lot of object orientated development could probably take a guess fairly quickly, but anyone who's new to this visit, take them a bit. And it's, it's going through a list of, uh, oh, if anyone could tell what those uh, episode titles are from, you're automatically one of my friends. But um, it's going through a list of episodes of something, um, parsing some stuff and then deciding based on a rating whether to add it to a list or not. It's Doctor Who, by the way. I don't know whether you have Doctor Who in Switzerland. It is, um, if you've not heard of it, it is the best TV series in the whole world. It, it actually is. It, it, if you look up the definition in the dictionary, that's actually what it says. I, I won't take any arguments, it is. Right. And that's what the functional version looks like. Now, if anyone at this point is saying, isn't that link? Yeah. Yeah, it's link. It's totally link. That's what it is. Because link is functional. Link is based on the functional paradigm. Because uh, think about it. Select statement, take a function, pass it in. Yeah, sure. It's You can't quite tell it's a function necessarily because it's an arrow, but it is a function. That x arrow x dot split, that's a function. That's not code. Well, it is, and so you know what I mean. Um, but that won't actually evaluate that split until the point where it needs it. That's just going to take that as a little pocket of code in a variable and then execute it when it needs it. So that's higher order functions. Link takes the old array and then creates you a new one based on the old one. 
There you go, immutable. It's functional. It's not a coincidence. It is actually a stated goal of the C-sharp team that as time goes on, they want each version of C-sharp to add more functional content compared to the last version. They're intending for C-sharp to support both paradigms, object-orientated and functional. Now, Steph Sharp can still do stuff that C-sharp can't, and that's why it's still there, and that's why it's still important. But as time goes on, they are trying to add more into the C-sharp world that we can play with. And uh, they can even... Um, Okay, I have a question. Uh, why is functional programming C sharp? Whether it exists function? Yeah, I see. I, I, I told uh, I told the guys that I get this asked this every single time. Uh, yeah, Simon, I think uh, we have some questions in, in the chat. Yeah. So first, uh, Urs, like uh, three four minutes ago, ask React. Yeah, I uh, and, and 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 now just K, uh, just ask a bit here. Why is functional programming in C sharp? whether it exists in Sharp. I think, Kay, you were not at the beginning of the talk because it's uh, probably a way to explore um, the functional the programming in, in the C Sharp. But um, Simon, please, uh, it's, it's your stage, so. Yeah, okay. Well, why, is why does functional programming in C Sharp exist when F Sharp exists? I literally get asked this every single time I do this talk nearly. Okay, why would I bother? So here's, here's at least my take on it. And uh, as, as I was saying to the guys before we started, I'll check my exits, because I know the F-sharp guys are quite passionate about uh, F-sharp and there's no reason they shouldn't be. F-sharp's cool, as far as I can see. No, no, okay, don't worry about the interruption, not a problem. Okay, so fact is, tons of people know C-sharp, flipping tons. If you went to an NDC conference, Throw a stone, you'll probably hit someone that knows C sharp. But you might have to hunt around for someone that knows F sharp. So from a business perspective, it is very easy, relatively, to get a whole load of C sharp guys onto your team. If you've decided to commit to F sharp, there's not that many F sharp guys out there. Folks, I should say folks. Um, so by taking on an additional dependency on F sharp, you are also to mean, uh, taking in a dependency on any new uh, folks you bring into the team to also know F sharp or to be prepared to learn it once they get there. So I would say, for the time being at least, I'm not saying F sharp won't have its day where it finally crosses that for threshold and becomes one of the well-known programming languages, but for the time being, I would say it is much easier from a support perspective to learn C sharp and learn the functional paradigm than to invest in learning F sharp. I'm not, now, having said that, if my boss said, you know what, we love F sharp, go learn F sharp. I would say, great, I'm up for that because I would be, F sharp is good. But I do know C sharp today. And a lot of the stuff I'm gonna show you on these slides, you can do today. And you don't need to uh, do any of that uh, stuff to allow F sharp to, to be, you know, to like share F sharp projects with your C sharp project or have an entirely uh, different build process or whatever you might need to uh, to have an F sharp project. I don't know, but that's that's my answer anyway. I'm not disparaging F sharp. F sharp, like I said, is good. And I would honestly like to be able to work in it, but to date, I have not worked anywhere that's ever allowed me to. So I make do. But what I'm effectively trying to do is get C sharp to play catch up with F sharp and to play with the toys. Um, so I was asked, can we miss C-sharp and F-sharp in one solution? Yes, you can. Yes, you absolutely can. I've never personally done it. My uh, always may be able to speak more to it, perhaps at the end, but as I understand it, F-sharp kind of appears in the, C, the project and C-sharp can interact with it kind of like static methods. That's roughly the way I understand it. So yes, absolutely. I, I have heard there are some limitations, but I don't know enough about it yet. I'll, I'll leave that one to us after because I'm not expert enough to be able to uh, comment. But right, I shall uh, I shall plod uh, plod on. So anyway, this is our functional code. So I've talked about how um, how it is based in the fun that link link is based in the functional paradigm. It totally is. But also, having done this, this is an awful lot easier to read. I mean, really. Uh, the, the order of operations are described, not necessarily executed because these are enumerables, but these are described in the order 
that we would think about them. If the business were to ask me, what does this function do? That's probably what I'd say to them in that order, because that's the way that logically it occurs to me. Now, if you go digging into the weird, weird world of innumerables beneath the surface, you'll probably find the actual order of operations is totally different to what you expect. But this is typical of um, these styles of paradigm that functional belongs to. That's you, you surrender control over the order of operations because, frankly, we don't care. Uh, TSQL is another example of this. You don't really care what the order of operations is in TSQL. Is it the select first? Is it the where first? Is it whatever? You don't really care. And this is typically the way in, uh, in, in, uh, in functional programming. There we go. Here's another example of something. This is the validation of a Nino. Now, for anyone not from the UK, this is a national insurance number. I used to work for um, a department that did uh, did some work for the government, so we did an awful lot to do with Ninos because it was to do with paying tax. And there's a whole load of validation rules that have to be applied. Now, notice the structure here. We've got a whole load of rules, and in each rule we say, check the rule. If the rule doesn't match, return false early. This is very non-functional, and it's very long-winded. Now, I've made, chosen something fairly small here, but we could easily double this in size. And every single time we want to add a new rule, we're going to have to replicate one, two, three, four, five, six lines or so every time. That sounds a bit hard to, to cope with. So the functional one could look something like this, for example. Now, I have separated out each of the validation rules into, um, into a private read-only variable. And I've done that because it's readability. You don't have to but I like to make my code readable. And another nice thing about functional is very easy to put more readability in. But the point is right down the bottom here, I got myself a call to link the dot all. Now dot all means go through the whole list, go through each one and do whatever's in here. Uh, whatever's in here is take the Nino, take out the space, probably have done that beforehand and um, run whatever this is. And oh, see, okay, uh, run whatever this is and then because each one will evaluate to a bool, either true or false. Now, all means every single one has to evaluate to true. Otherwise, it'll just kill it early and not bother to execute the rest. So all of that structure that we saw on the last page, all of that piles of if statement followed by early return is now implicit in the structure of the code. Easy peasy. And if you want to add a new rule in, just slide an extra rule in here, easy. There you go. Or oh, I could stick it into an extension method. I am actually quite a fan of extension methods, provided you use them with caution. Uh, don't put business logic in them, chaps. Uh, but other than that, they're good. And that is really nice and easy to read. Plus, I need to replace early. Look at that. That's easy to read. I could show this code to the business and they would understand what it did. You might not necessarily be able to enhance it or change it, but they could at least understand this at a glance, which is great win this is another one of these sorts of structures these are these are the sort of structures that you use around uh, higher order functions this is an alt now alt means i want an uh, i want to give you a load of functions that are going to do the same operation i'm imagining that these are two different ways of querying a database maybe one represents a flat file and one represents a tsql live database maybe one represents a, a web service call i don't really know i don't really care but the point is i've got two sources to the same data and I'm saying, here are a set of operations, and um, I'm going to pass you in the query, run one, if it don't work, do the other, alt. So and in my imaginary case, uh, does not return, returns a null. So this is going to be a null, and that would be not a null. And in, take my word for it, this actually results in a correct thing working. This is how it works under the surface. I just put in a couple of extension methods. I uh, create a new one called if default do, which takes attaches to T, T being a generic, T therefore being everything. So it attaches to everything. I take a func, which is the thing to do else, and my input. So try a thing. And if it didn't, yeah, sorry, evaluate the current thing. If the current thing is a null, then do the else function. Otherwise, um, return the not null thing back. And then here we go. Here we're trying our first function and then calling here and if default do to say, if this return null, then do this thing. That took me flipping ages to explain, but 
dead simple to look at, isn't it? And that's kind of the point. There's a whole load of dirty um, structure behind the surface, but what it's actually doing is quite simple. Fork is another one. Uh, now, this is so ridiculously simple that you would never bother to do this here, but I'm just demonstrating. So a fork means take the same base input, split it into as many prongs, as it were, like the prongs of a fork, and run something simultaneously on each prong in isolation, and then give a function which joins all of those returns back. Now, here I am saying, take this input string, uh, run a count of A's, count of B's, count of C's, and then this is my stick them back together function here, which is saying, take those three integer sums and um, give me a final sum. Now, honestly, I, there's better ways of doing that at C-sharp, but I'm just trying to demonstrate a point. There are all sorts of reasons why you might want to have run a load of simultaneous operations on the same thing. And that's how that would run under the surface. It's again done with a map is one of the little best friend functions that you never realized you needed. And it's just like a select, except it operates on the entire object. It means that you can do these long, nice select style fluid expressions with a whole load of stuff changing from A to B to C to D, only you don't, uh, it applies to objects, not just arrays. So I really, really like this and I use this quite a lot. But this is just saying, take the prongs, it's a params. Params is another one of those little underused features that I adore. And um, run the prongs, run each one, do a select, and then do a map to join and back together with whatever the join. It's not too complicated. Moving on to some pattern recognition. This is hopefully these days. Now, when I started doing this, this was wild and exotic stuff. But uh, C-sharp's kind of caught up with me since then. So... Um, this is our classic object orientated example of a bank account. I've started with rules for a standard bank account, a super duper one, which I'm guessing got extra huge amounts of money in a, a dodgy bank account with a, a, a brown paper bag of money. Uh, I, I might, if there was a time when I would um, name and shame a politician I didn't care for at this point, but these days, take your pick. Whichever one you don't care for, that's them right there. Uh, and there we go. That's. Until recently, that was pretty much the c sharp way of doing this. Um, this is a case, but we can case by type. Surprisingly, a lot of people don't know you could do this, but you can. And I'm switching on. This is actually the, 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 base, the base object, which is a standard bank account, I think. And I'm casing on. It's actually a dodgy, in which case we apply the extra interest rate and uh, the brown paper bag or a super duper account, which has got its bonus interest rate or perhaps another special rule for a when, which is to say that the balance of the standard bank account is less than 10,000. Uh, otherwise, we'll, we'll double the interest rate for some reason. I don't know. I'm making this up, really. But the point is that you can switch on feeding in a base type. You can switch on the child object and the properties of the child object. We've been able to do this for a while with C Sharp. And as of the very latest C Sharps, you could do this now. I think, does it, is it C Sharp 9 when this stuff came in? But this is just a nice, lovelier syntax where we can kind of do this vaguely JSON-y style selects. And it's the same basic idea. And this is really nice. So this is this is functional. This is functional programming coming into the C-sharp world. So if you've been using this stuff, you've been getting into functional already again. Same like link. That's, uh, and this is nice. This is absolutely lovely. And can you imagine the sheer amount of code I would have to write if I was to write this out without this stuff? If I was to write it longhand, as it were, it'd be a lot. Also stops you from one of the cardinal sins of programming, doing too many things inside one of these guys. Um, it is a temptation to write if statements, which are long, and then have sub if statements and then sub if statements. Once you start doing that, you have gone down the dark path and there may be no return for you. I have seen functions that ended up thousands of lines long with if statements that ended up looking like someone's family tree. So beware. Immutability. Can we do, uh, must be said, ba.compute compute interest is lovelier. <laughs> uh, yeah, that would be an extension method again, I would guess. Um, well, at least that was how I would do it. I don't like to mix my data classes and my um, logic classes. But um, sure, right, immutability. Can we do immutability in C-sharp? <laughs> kind of. F sharp, I think everything's immutable out of the box. So is this immutable? Yeah, 
this is immutable. I've taken away the setters and I've added everything into the parameters of the uh, constructor. Yeah, it's immutable. Don't look very nice, but it's immutable. How about now? Is it mutable now? Nah, it's not immutable because the list, sure, I cannot replace the list with a new list, but I can still add to it. So it's not immutable. It's immutable now. Woo. <laughs> but, you know, there are all sorts of classes like this. Now it's not immutable again. Look, I've just added a subclass. This subclass doesn't follow immutability. So it's not immutable again. And, and so on and so forth. I mean, what if I added a class from a third party library? In? There's no way I can make it mutable. It's impossible. Uh, so basically, no, not really. Uh, oh, I'll go back to that in a minute. So yeah, there are ways you can enforce it. I'll get into that in a second. I'll tell you what, I'll do that now. Function, there we go. This is relatively new. I'm, I'm not quite sure what C Sharp 10 does yet, but you can um, you can turn on uh, warnings, and they're just warnings, compiler warnings in C Sharp to say you're trying to make something null or something can be null. This is one way of doing it. You could put this um, this statement up the top there, hashtag nullable enable. Uh, it's not really a hashtag, but uh, I like calling it that. But, um, you know, yeah, that's pretty good. At least it's giving you a warning, although putting one of those in every single code uh, file in your entire thing, that's, that's ugly. So I don't like that. It puts in warnings like this if you're trying to make something null, you know, yay. That's good. It's better than not. And you can override it. There's the bang. Um, always talked about the bang. We can have the C sharp. We have the bang in C sharp too. That in this case, this one, this bang is saying, yes, it is allowed to be null. I am a grown up. Let me basically. And that's all good. Uh, you can also turn on the whole thing uh, into the whole code base by putting this guy in there. Now you can see this code's file. This is a little out of date because I think we're up to six now. But you can um, you, you can put stuff in the project that turns this onto the whole thing. But I would uh, personally. Sure, have the compiler warnings, but just it doesn't really, it, you can't really ever make your code base properly immutable in C sharp. It's just not ever going to be possible. Not unless you're going to never use a third party library, never use a list. Actually, I never use a list, but that's another, that's another point for another time. But, uh, you know, so I would just pretend. <laughs> As it were, I would just pretend it's all immutable and that's fine. It's good. So if, if I just keep that in my head and treat everything as immutable, that for me is good enough. Uh, oh, yeah. Sorry. That's, that's, that's another way. Or This is actually this is new as of about C sharp nine. I think you've got the I think it always showed this. Uh, you can have a init type, which means that you can only instantiate it within. That's pretty good as well. I would probably, I should probably shift to doing this more. It'll it'll throw an actual error if you try and change prop two, but you've still got the same old problems with uh, with your lists and, and so on and so forth. So we're still kind of fighting a losing battle because this is stuff being added to C sharp way, way, way after an assumption was made that everything is mutable. Record types, again, Oz has talked about these. I love record types. They are one of my favorite additions to C Sharp in a very long time. Previous to that, it was the, the new funky switch statements. That was my previous best thing ever in C Sharp. This is my new best thing ever in C Sharp. And this is great because this makes it so much easier to be immutable. When you use the with to create a new, um, a new record type, it's creating a copy of the old one with this change. That's brilliant. So previously, we probably had to have written the whole thing out longhand to maintain mutability, just literally copy everything over from one to the other. Now we don't have to because it's all dealt with with this. This is actually using this with the original is untouched. That's brilliant. I love this. Uh, if you haven't used record types yet, use them. Use them today. Go on. They're great. Now, curry. I said I would do it. Here we go. Here we go. Here we go. It has got nothing to do with delicious Indian food, which is a great shame because I am a great fan thereof, but it is nothing. It's actually named after Haskell Curry. Um, so if I were to write a non, <laughs> as I says, he's now hungry. I have been accused of this often when I give talks. There is a, a user group called uh, .NET Oxford. And every single time I go there, I somehow manage to bring food up in my talks. And the uh, the uh, the guy that runs it has to go away and get himself something to eat after we're, we've done. So there we go. The, the disease is spreading and it's all my fault. <laughs> right, Curry. If I were to write a proverbial 
non-curried ad, it'll look kind of like this. A plus B, dead simple, right? And that's 30. To add, give it 10, give it 20, we've got 30. Simple, easy, no worries. So what's this giving me back? What's this one? So I, this is now an imaginary um, uh, curried ad. I've given it only one variable. What do I get back? I, I think someone, I don't know if you... Uh, Adult Krim there. I don't know if you meant to be off that. Ah, thank you. Um, right. Uh, so what would I get back if I gave it only one? If this was a non-curried, I'd get an error because there's two parameters, dummy. But in this case, anyone going to uh, throw me the answer? You've got three seconds. 42. Ah, Douglas Adams fan. Respect. Uh, no. Actually, now this is a rule of thumb with functional programming. You get back a function. See, in functional programming, yes, there you go. Spot on. Give that man a coconut or person. Um, yes, rule of thumb in functional programming. If there is a question, the answer is functions. Kind of works all the time. And so I have the question, and yes, you get back a function. By giving it only the single 10, I have returned an add 10 function. I've got back a function where the 10 is filled in and it's asking for the other one. There you go. In this hypothetical example, I've now got a function where I could pass a 20 and get back my 30 because now the all parameters have been supplied. Now, can C sharp do this? No, not really. Kind of a bit, sort of. Now, F sharp does. F sharp does this out the box. I think F sharp does this with everything. Uh, can we approximate it a bit? We can. We can just about approximate it. I have used this. It has its uses. So these, these are kind of curried functions. Notice that there are two arrows, one arrow, two arrows. This is an arrow function that returns another arrow function. So if I were to call this and give it 10, I would actually be returning this. I would be returning back a function that gives me 10. And you could string these things together into uh, long lists of different adds and subtracts and multiplies in, in an array of funks. And maybe you could do all sorts of interesting things with them. I have used this for stuff in the past. If nothing else, it looks prettier. But, uh, and you could probably do this for all sorts of other things, but by and large, I don't. By and large, I haven't really done an awful lot with this. This is a, a more, a, this, this perhaps is somewhere where it might be more useful to apply currying. This is um, a great big long function, which is doing a whole load of stuff. So this is again, returning to my pars of, uh, of this CSV file of, of Doctor Who titles. So there's a whole load of things we wanna do here. Uh, we want to split by line, then we want to split by field, then we want to trim off the beginnings and ends, and we want to decide which of these fields we want to return. And we could make this all generic by making a func here, which uh, takes each of these four variables. So using this, we can... Um, ooh, my headset's running out of batteries. Right, um, so using this, we can... We can create a little function which is totally generic it could pass almost any number of uh, csv styles uh, now I, yeah i know that the speech marks are not speech marks so i'm keeping things simple but that's an awful lot to have to supply all flaming four variables every single time that's rather tedious so we can do things like this this is uh an, i don't know if it's a form of currying or it's an alternative to currying it's called a partial application and uh, this is where you can supply two or more or three or whatever of the parameters out of the total set, and then get back a function which takes however many parameters are left. Same sort of idea. So I could create myself something where I pass in, now the first two parameters as it happens are, what's the thing to split the new line by, uh, to split the, the record by, and what's the thing to split the field by, so it's a new line and a comma. So now I've got myself a function that give it any CSV of this format, it will just split it into an array of arrays and uh, give you that back every single time. And I can call that as many times as I want, wherever I want. And then I could um, uh, call it again and uh, we get back, uh, pass it the zero, which is to say that I now have a function which will give me all the all the serial codes. Each, each story has a... Oh, thank you. Coffee. Right, where was I? Sorry, got distracted by the lovely. Um, right, so you get the idea. Or I could pass it to one and um, get back a function now, which goes and parses and brings back a list of all the episode titles. I can create many different functions 
based on the same one gigantic base function with loads of parameters. And I don't have to replicate code. I just write the one. I don't have to copy paste, slightly change something, which would be the old method of doing it. Copy the whole function perhaps, or literally supply all of the uh, parameters every single time, which is kind of ugly. So this is nice and elegant. So you can do this, but this is the awfulness beneath the surface. So I am gonna have to take, write loads of these. So what it's saying is for every single, first off, you have to make sure that the thing is a funk. It has to be, otherwise it doesn't work because there's no way to directly reference a function in this manner. Um, and then we're gonna have to think of every number of parameters going to every other number of parameters, like one for three to two, one for three to two, one for three to one, one for, and so on. Any combination you could, so you're gonna have to write a file which has got just boatloads of these flipping things. So you can, should you, I leave that question to yourselves to answer, but it can be done. So talking, moving towards the end, I believe, uh, talking about, this is a more typical functional flow. In many ways, it is better to think of functional programming in terms of um, things like TSQL. We are applying list operations. So first chance you get, split it to a list, turn it from one thing to a list of things, apply list operations, and then finally, aggregate. Aggregate from many things to one thing. That's how functional works. So there's a really, really, really nasty example of some aggregation there. And that's the sort of code I have been forced to write in the past. And all that's doing is taking a whole load of uh, strings, sticking them together and making sure that there's a comma between each one, except the last one, because that would be weird. We could do this. Oops. Oh, ah, we could do this. String.join. You are welcome. If you did not know string.join, there you go. Uh, but there are other ways of doing aggregation. String.join though is, is, seems to be one of those weird little buried secrets of C-sharp. I'm surprised how few people use it. But here's a more complicated aggregation. I want to create, um, turn this list of story, Doctor Who stories. I want to create a list of, um, a, a, a total of how many episodes were in each story, because Doctor in the old days, it was, uh, it was serials, each one had multiple episodes, and how many are missing because 97 episodes of Doctor Who to this day are missing. It's sad. If any of you have got them, by the way, would you, if you would not mind handing them back, that would be, would be lovely. Um, so how can you do it? We could do separate sums, cause averages, or you could do use what is one of my favorite features of C-sharp that's been in there since C-sharp three, and I don't know why no one knows about it. Aggregate. I love this. It is so flaming powerful, and hardly anyone seems to know about it. But here it is, aggregate, right there under our nose this whole time. So aggregate, what does it do? It's uh, recursive, I believe, which is how it works. Uh, you give it a seed value, which in my case is a tuple. I'm giving it a tuple of int int, which is my total of missing and my total of existing epi of, uh, well, episodes overall. And then you also give it a function. The function takes the running total after looking at each item in the array and the current item. This is your x in your lambda expression. So what you have to do is transform the previous running total using the current item into the new running total and then run this against every item in the array. And then you get, and in my case, I'm just doing additions. And uh, you could also work out a percentage here if you wanted at the end. This is rather a trivial example because I wanted to keep the logic a little silly and a little light, a little easy, but I'm sure there's plenty of examples folks can think of where you had a complex operation to run on an array of objects to convert it into a, a report or a final figure or, or something and aggregates the way forward. There's no need to do loops with lists and or state tracking variables. This will do everything for you. So last topic, I believe now, Fahrenheit to Celsius. I am British. Yes, I, in case you hadn't noticed, I am. And there is a cliche that British people love to talk about the weather. It is entirely true. We do. Uh, it's because we tend to get up to four seasons in a single day. It happens. I had a day last week. It snowed. It was sunny. We got everything. We got it all in one day. That's our. So uh, and I used to work for an American company. And of course, being British, I talked to them about the weather and they would say things like, I can't do the accent. I'm not going to do the accent. It's just embarrassing for me to try. But they would say things like it's 100 degrees outside. And I would think 100 degrees. That's the boiling point of water. You must all be dead. 
Oh, wait, Fahrenheit. Yes, Fahrenheit. That thing you use and no one else does. Right. Uh, so the temperature conversion of Fahrenheit is minus, deduct 32, multiply by five, divide by nine. Of course it is. And uh, then do a round and then maybe I'll, I'll return a, a nicely formatted string with degree centigrade. That's lovely, isn't it? It's lovely. But a lot of, mu lot of muting, 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 changing state there. So how can I do this in a functional way? There is a way. Looks like this. So identity, I'm making it a generic. And think of this as thing in a box, thing in a box. This is my identity. It's a box. I put the thing in the box. And uh, it, the, the thing in the box is my, very, is my value at each point of that calculation. So first it's uh, whatever the first thing is, then it's the next thing in the box is thing minus 32 and so on. Just a couple of nice little bits of syntactic sugar down here just to make it easy. And add in an extension method, I'll call it bind because historical reasons, I don't know. I don't know why we, I've heard it called map, I've heard it called all sorts of things, but bind is good. And what this takes is, this attaches to all identities. And then it takes a funk, which turns old type to new type. Maybe that's same to same, maybe that's int to int, maybe that's double to double, but it could also be string to int, could be int or whatever. Point is, give me the function that does the transformation of the old thing to new thing. And then I'll return you a new identity containing the new thing in a box. So it's like a relay race. You got folks, each one is taking the old box, pulling the variable out, doing a thing, giving the putting it in a new box, and then passing it along again one after the other until you get to the end and you get a answer. There we go, looks like this now. And look, there's those flipping curry dads and divides and things. I told you, I told you I use them sometimes. This is how I use them. So bearing in mind that a call, this is curried, so a call to this subtract gets me back a funk. So this is just a shorthand for x arrow x minus 32. So it just looks nicer, doesn't it? But you don't have to, the arrow's good. But that's what each one of these binds is doing. And there you go, I'm using arrows there. So this is, um, like a select, but operating on the whole object, because none of these are actually arrays. They're they're up there. Uh, actually, they're primitives. Largely, they're decimals, um, except for here. It's now no longer a decimal. This one's give me a decimal, uh, and I'll give you a string, and then return finally the string. Lovely, isn't it? Easy. Looks elegant. Looks nice, flowing. And if you want to add a new line in, just stick a new thing in between. Do dot bind. Do your thing. This is called a monad. This is what a monad is. That's all it is, really. Has a bit more to it, but fundamentally, that's all it is. It's a relay race. Take a thing, do a thing, pass it on again. And then the next person does the same thing. Easy. See, it's not all that hard. And there's there's some that here's here's something that could be uh, could be a problem. Now um, I'm doing a call to get person two. Now who knows what that might be? This, but this might return something, this might return null if I put in an ID that doesn't exist. And then I'm going to do a string format. I'm going to, I don't know, because I'm cool and I like wear my baseball cap backwards and all that stuff, I'm going to turn it into leet speaks. So I'm going to replace all the A's with fours, the E's with threes, blah, blah, and so on, so that I look well cool. Uh, and I'll probably impress all the kids or something. But the point is, if this is null and I pass null in here, what do I get? Big explosion. Big explosion, because if null dot first name can't happen. So, is there a way of dealing with this so that this error never happens? Well, there is. There's a way of making it so that this error literally never happens. And this is one of my favorite features of functional programming to the point that I use this all the flipping time now because I can't conceive of writing that sort of code without this security built in. Uh, it's the same idea as the identity, okay? It's just, uh, I'll call it maybe this time. Call it maybe. The point is that there are now two states. So this is an abstract, still the same idea. There's my value, still thing in a box, but I'm implementing it twice. One I'm calling just, I've heard it called other things, call it something. I've heard it called all sorts, but this is good enough for now or nothing. Now the point is there are two, I'm making it so that for each point of my uh, series of transformations, there are two states that could come out of each one, something or nothing. OK, and I don't want it to do anything if nothing came out of the previous step. So if null comes in, null is nothing. Uh, so I don't want it to do anything. I, I just want it to pass the error on. Which looks like this as it happens. 
tell you what, I'll come back to that in a minute, because first let's think about this. Rob. The best explanation I ever I ever um, saw of this, this was on Scott Vlashin's website, a website I recommend to everyone, F Sharp for Fun and Profit. He calls this railway orientated architecture, I believe. The idea is that you've got two train lines running along like this in parallel. And every now and then there's a set of points. And each point is one of those binds, one of those operations, one of those transformations. And at each set of points, we start off on the happy path at the top. This is something, 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 something. But, oh, this one failed. So at this point, you shift to the nothing path. The nothing path does not execute any subsequent steps. And it just glides to the end, doing nothing. So in my example, based on this idea, if this returns null, that is nothing, this function will not execute. Because that's a function. So it'll only execute when I say. The logic's all contained inside the bind. So it means we are safe from a null exception ever occurring. It just won't. I don't have to write different branching um, blocks of code to handle the something, the nothing, the whatever. I just write one chain of operations and the environment, the bind system will protect me from ever worrying about errors again. This is when I say that the uh, functional programming tends to be more robust. This is one of the big reasons why. There's what it actually looks like. OK, I'm not going to dwell too much on this. I, the source code is around if anyone wants to see it, but it's basically inside. It's just uh, it's just one of these selects where it's selecting against is the previous thing coming in um, uh, already a nothing? Is it a something that contains null and put a try catch? So also, if the thing errors, then we'll also consider that to be a nothing. Easy peasy. Lovely. Uh, there's another option you can have either where you can literally have different types in the one side or the other. Now, whenever I do something like this, I usually put the exception in the left. So in this hand, we it's the right hand of, of justice or the, the left hand of evil. Um, so the right is the happy path and the, the left is the exception, the error path. So I'll stick the exception in. So what it means is at the end, I can do, I can examine the object. And if it's a right, then I will just say it worked. Here's the result. If it's a left, I will say it didn't work. Report back to the user and also log the error somewhere. Yeah, that's really, really, really powerful. And the, the, the new 2i there looks pretty similar, to be honest. Again, I'm not going to dwell too much on this. I can share the code if anyone would like to see it. Um, a press now often get asked, are there any languages, any uh, NuGet packages out there in C-sharp to implement this stuff for you? Yeah, language X, there's one. Uh, I personally prefer to do this myself. If nothing else, it's good practice and gets me used to the way of thinking. But I've had to play with language X. There you go. That's what language X look like. It looks pretty similar, pretty similar to what I've already done. Uh, I think one of the big differences is when you come out of a monad, uh, you have to provide a match statement which says what to do if it was one or the other, and then it will execute based on that. So does that. I like to be a bit more, um, I like to make up my own uh, custom baby, to be honest, but hey, this is good too. I know it has its fans and I'd say go check it out if you, if you want. Places to go for further reading, uh, hot off the presses. I am actually in talks with O'Reilly at the moment to write a book on this very subject. Um, I'm hoping all goes well. The publicity will be starting within the next month or so. So watch this space for that. Otherwise, I absolutely love the Functional Programming C Sharp book by Enrico Buonanno. It is a brilliant, brilliant book. I'd say it's easily one of the best programming books I've read in years. So do check that out. And second edition is now available. So I'd go for that um, uh, if my book isn't out by then. Hint, hint. Uh, there is Functional C Sharp by Vishnu Angoro. I have re not read that one in so much detail. It's pretty good. But honestly, I like the Buenano book the most. It's a very, very good book. Uh, Kathleen Dollard's talk, that is from NDC Oslo, I believe. That was actually what got me started. That was the very first exposure I had to functional thinking. It's a very good talk, and I'd recommend that thoroughly as well. There are courses on Pluralsight. I don't have a Pluralsight subscription. If anyone wants to gift me one, do feel free. I do not say no to gifts, but I don't have one, so I haven't seen these talks. But uh, I've seen, they seem to be well regarded. And I have already mentioned several times F Sharp Fun and Profit, Scott Blashin's website. It's a very good website, not just for F Sharp developers. There are some fantastic um, theory-based um, articles on there, which even if you're a C Sharp developer like me, are still useful. So I do recommend that website. And I have friends who would probably hate me if I didn't mention that there are books on Haskell, like Learn Your Haskell for Great Good, 
Uh, I have never personally worked in Haskell. I know there are people who say that maybe learning a pure functional language is a good exercise in learning how better to do your, your uh, C-sharp functional. That might be, might be. But for me, that sounds a bit like you should learn Latin in order to learn any European language. Eh, I, 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 I mean, yeah, I am learning Latin, but that's because I'm a nerd. Uh, but I would argue that modern Italian is much more fun and useful. Okay, that's it. That's me done. I'm going to have coffee and listen if there's any questions. Uh, or is everyone in a state of awed silence? So, gentlemen, somebody that wants Simon not to drink his coffee, please go ahead and talk. I don't bite much. <laughs> Often. Okay, bit. All right. I think if now it's a moment my questions maybe to both the speakers to Urs and Simon regarding which one is better I, I, I got quite a bit of eye opener so I did not relate um, on, on my side um, these uh, monad concept to the, the kind of fluent API that we have in link you right even such a similar syntax we, we can do even when it's uh, not immutable as well, so so we get the the benefits of that. Usually, we uh, at least at work we call it a builder. That at the end you put the build and then you you get the object. And meanwhile, you you have a intermediate object, but but then you are modifying the, the same object always. Hmm. I, I expect. Yeah. Oh, go on. Uh, oh no, I'm sorry, but, no, but yeah, we experiment with the builder pattern uh, quite a lot and, and we did a lot of immutable builders actually because you can of course use it with yes. a mutable structure in the background and and it's a lot of typing actually in C sharp and and I, I, I could yes. I would do some little <laughs> advertisement here because there are some little packages we wrote for that and, um, and one of them contains a generator for an immutable state machine which does exactly that you have a you can formulate your state machine and it generates the code back in so it passes you call a method and you get back the next state and you can use it to to do your own is that an open builders. source project yes it's, it's, uh... it's an open source pro uh, it's um okay first i have to go one one step back i really want to thank <laughs> simon and us for those great talks and it was was really fun to join today and 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 it was really yeah we we do it a lot we we do a lot of c sharp and i did f sharp for about a year and i loved it and i would always do f sharp if i could again but um, i wanted to have all those stuff in in the c sharp world and so we put a lot of work into having it there and we pushed some things uh, uh, quite far like like simon showed and perhaps a little bit further because um, I think you, you have the source generators now and we use them to have have match methods uh, because okay um, I perhaps I should let I, I would like to tell a little bit about that perhaps there's a possibility to have have a talk but perhaps if anyone has a question I would let them <laughs> uh, talk first and then I perhaps I can have five minutes and just tell 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 you what we did there because it fits really nice in in what we heard um so i would let others yeah um i have a question <laughs> for you alex can you share the link to your open source project uh, yeah uh, yeah uh, and uh, also i have a question for urs and simon mm -hmm. if um, would you mind to share your slides you can share them as pdf but that would be great to have that to have the links to the also this this project you you mentioned to these um I think the last one was lang language X. Yeah. I, I was curiously looking at that and looking at implementations on monads on C sharp and I got somehow to this language X, but I don't know if it's the same. Yeah, I, I think it's probably, I mean, to be honest, I would honestly say if you're interested in going monads and you should be, I think monads are one of the best um, developments in programming in a long time. I say do it yourself, honestly. Sit there. It's not much. I mean, you could write a monad in just like half a dozen lines of code, it's hardly anything. But the insight it will give you, because generally 
most people I know have gotten into functional. It seems odd. It seems confusing. And then suddenly there's a light bulb moment and it all just clicks and it makes sense. And from that point on, you don't really ever find any of it difficult anymore. So do it yourself if you've got the patience and the time to do it. It won't take long. Try and understand it. It's worth it. It's, I, I think it always made the point that, um, that there's less to learn in functional than there is in, uh, in object-oriented. It never occurred to me before, but I believe it's entirely correct. It is actually a simpler paradigm. can answer the question that came up earlier, whether we can make C-sharp and F-sharp in one solution. Uh, yes, you can. Uh, the thing that is that you have to, if you add a project or assembly to the solution, you have to decide whether it's C-sharp, F-sharp or VB. And, but you can reference C-sharp from F-sharp and vice versa. And F-sharp is built to have great interoperability with C-sharp. So F-sharp knows everything that C-sharp can do. You can't do everything in F-sharp, but it knows everything so that you can uh, reference every any C-sharp code. Um, referencing F-sharp from C-sharp works, but it's not that nice. You can call F-sharp code, but it's sometimes a bit tedious. If you want to do that, normally you have to write a small wrapper around the F-sharp code that is C-sharp friendly. But uh, we have a mixed code base and we call F-sharp from C-sharp and C-sharp from F-sharp all the way. It's, it works really great. Actually, Urs, would you mind reaching out to me on Twitter or similar? I have some questions to follow you up. Uh, I'd like to pose to you at a bit outside the scope of this, but uh, I, have, I have some ideas I wish to pursue. Sure. So if you could connect with me, that'd be terrific. Any more for any more? I think at one point that you had this uh, went to went to functional. And I think one point I would miss there is, is because you couldn't model your domain uh, so nicely in the functional type system, which is um, one point you could could add perhaps there, which I would be a point for me to use, to use a functional language or F sharp, especially, I don't know any other, <laughs> I have to <Yeah>. confess. <laughs> That's actually, it's a good point. To be honest, I have probably, I think to a large extent, modern development is so inspired by functional that I almost forgot that that was a point. I think we're, we're kind of, <laughs> even if we're not really functional developers, I think we're kind of doing that style anyway, yeah, yeah. to a large extent now. The, the whole idea, you know, the whole idea of separating out your, your domain from your, um, from your logic, like that's, that's become very entrenched, doesn't it? Yeah. And I think this is the main reason why they put such a lot of stuff in C sharp because they won't people to to be able to use it uh, there too because it's yeah you said it's it's hard to to do pure f sharp because you don't find people it's hard to find find folks yeah i, I think the but, argument uh, that it's hard to find f sharp people is really a bad argument yeah because <laughs> you, sorry you don't find the people that can all the technologies that you use whether it's a language a framework a tool um, so, and in two years, in the future, the tools have changed, so you have to relearn them anyway. Yes. But yeah, that's the reason I, I hear a lot. And of course, there are way more C-sharp developers at the moment than there are F-sharp yeah. developers. So but I, I think this, the code bases in C-sharp will, will tend to um, grow into a direction where they get way more similar to the F-sharp to no, the functional things. I don't think so. No, no, no. <laughs> C-Sharp okay. gets more and more features. Yeah. That's true. But the problem is in the things that are in C-Sharp that aren't in F-Sharp, there are no statements. Type inference is a problem in C-Sharp. You won't yes. never get. So all, all the code that Simon showed with his uh, extension methods, um, this code in F sharp, it just leaves out all the types. So it's much <laughs> more concise and easier to understand uh, because the function weren't complicated. It's just a lot of symbols, uh, a lot of generics. So, or things like um, immutability by default, 
So in C sharp, you will always have mutability by default, and it's hard to get things immutable in C sharp. You can do it, but it's always a lot of typing. Yeah. yeah. And the, the, the examples that Sa Simon showed, they are nice. We also do a lot of functional stuff in C sharp. So it's it's not about functional and oh, oh so because C sharp is multi paradigm, and F sharp is multi paradigm. But uh, uh, maybe I can show a slide. Uh, I think it, it's certainly the expressed intention of C sharp, the C sharp team, that it, it will support both paradigms indefinitely. Yeah. But I think it started off with link and the extension method stuff and the expression. Uh, yeah. I think, the... I think link was <laughs> the C change that started yeah. the fun. Yeah. That was the first real functional addition yeah. i don't think it even originated as an idea from uh like a lot of things i think java was there ahead of us but um no it, it's it's definitely the ball that we at c sharp team picked up and carried on running with it's, an, it's another talk from from mine but it's about what are the object oriented features and the functional feature that c sharp and f sharp support mm. and the problem is this here these are I'm... typical can you see the screen yeah, yeah, yeah. These are the typical functional uh, things. And the problem is C sharp doesn't have any of these, whereas F sharp has almost all the features of C sharp. Yeah. And of no, course, no, it's, easier to, it's easier to use things on the right in F sharp. It's easier to use things on the left in C sharp. But uh, you don't have pipelines. Yeah, you can simulate them with extension methods. But the mm. problem is, performance they are not optimized uh, yeah but c sharp compiler doesn't optimize functions as good as f sharp compiler for yeah. example no problem. So, i i would tend to agree with that if if um i i I've, i usually make a point of saying that if if uh, if performance is your like your number one overriding concern and it trumps everything else then probably functional c sharp is not the way forward for you I think it's good enough, and these days, generally speaking, it's easy to chuck some more RAM at something than it is to, to redevelop it, so I would just say chuck some more RAM at it, but it depends. I mean, if you're working on a mobile device or something where memory is is a real like factor, then yeah. steer clear of this. If performance is your main concern, you probably shouldn't take .NET anyway. <laughs> yeah, I think, <laughs> I think 99% of the .NET, .NET software written is... They, it just doesn't matter if you yeah. use functional constructs in C sharp or not. It's, it's just it's yeah. like we said: take your everyday uh, yeah. um, um, code and and you can just write it. And yeah, I think historically <laughs> they've always aimed it at medium scale businesses where they they're like they're big enough now that they need some custom bespoke code, but they're not so big. That, you know, like um, I used to work for a betting company where performance was everything because on race day or sports yeah. day, you know, they got hit with so much traffic that every tiniest little bit of memory they could save was important. C sharp doesn't really do that. I think SQL server probably could, but um, that's a different matter. But um, one was actually also and somebody I'll probably need to give a talk on one day is something missing from your list. that's not supported by C sharp tail recursion. So recursion is how you'd use do loops in, in the uh, functional world. No, that's not true. Is that not true? No, because uh, C sharp one doesn't. Way. It's one way. The problem, mm -hmm. is, problem with recursion is if you have recursion on a long list, yes. it's a stack of low. So you could have, if you can have a tail recursive operation, that will the compiler will change that into a loop. Yeah. But a lot of things in F sharp are implemented as loops anyway. Mm. So like the thing you mentioned with the aggregate, mm. aggregate is uh, a loop inside, it's not recursion. Oh, okay. Because you just loop over all the elements once and carry mm. the, the state with you. Mm. It's a loop, it's, it doesn't have to be uh, recursion. Okay, so, what, so F sharp doesn't support true tail recursion? Yeah, it does. Oh, it does? Okay, because C sharp okay. doesn't, so I don't think that. I think this does. F sharp does, it's, yeah, yeah. F sharp, but it's hard to get it correct uh, oh, sometimes. Okay. But I'm okay. no expert in tail recursion, so no. But uh, I know there, I've seen art. I've seen at least three or four articles on ways to kind of fudge 
tail recursion. The tail recursion, by the way, is a way of allowing recursion without the huge memory overhead. Because um, if you're doing a recursion and there's three items in the list, who cares? It's fine. But if there's a thousand things in the list, then with classical recursion, you're keeping a thousand functions open in memory until the last one executes, at which point the thousand functions all collapse down into a final answer. Yeah, you probably um, get the stack overflow exception first. Probably, yeah, probably will. It, it'd be horrible. So, so tail recursion is a way of doing that without the stack overflow problem. And to my knowledge, it isn't directly implemented in C-sharp at all. Okay. It is in F-sharp. And I, like I say, I think there are ways of fudging in C-sharp. And that's, that's perhaps one of the things I'd like to discuss with you always at some point. But, I don't uh, know about... C-sharp doesn't provide it out of the box. No. So far, I, I do know it. But if you can simulate it somehow, I don't know. I, I've seen a few articles that had ideas. And I've got... Anyway, that's, that's a, perhaps a... As, as a discussion for another time, perhaps. But yeah, it is another thing item missing, item missing from your lift that's not C-sharp, but is F-sharp, and that's tail recursion. So otherwise, if you're doing a functional C-sharp with recursion, treat it with caution, because it's not performant at all Yeah, but in C-sharp. I'm absolutely with you. The C-sharp code we have, we use an AP implementation, we have a result implementation, something like you showed, mm -hmm. because it makes... C sharp code easier to understand mm. than just working with nulls. Yeah. But uh, the syntax is most of the time quite verbose. But you could, can compared. optimize, you can push it pretty far. And that's what basically we tried with those yeah. packages. Because I, I'm, I'm, yeah, one thing I love about, about F sharp are the, the discriminated union because you can model so precisely and you have those mm. compiler backed switches which tell you oh hey, here's another case or a case was removed and the compiler breaks and you can of course do it in c sharp by writing a function that handles every derived case and have it in on only one place but it's always a lot of typing and that's where those refactorings come in and you have now mm. built little source generators where you can annotate it an abstract base type to, to generate those mass ma match methods with async and whatever. And you can come, you never come to this comfortable level of F sharp, uh, of, yeah, of F sharp, but you can push it pretty far. Mm -hmm. And you have this problem with the generic and the type inference, which is not so nice in C sharp. And one point where you have it is this result construct. It's the construct where we, which Simon mentioned from the railway oriented mm -hmm programming where you have one good case and an, and the error case can carry a nice error. And in, in, in F sharp, you have this error type as a generic type and the good type as a generic type. If you try that in, in C sharp, you, you go crazy because the compiler never knows, which you always have to specify all generic cases. And there's an this was another try. We have a source generator where you can just annotate a little type and it generates you all this map and bind magic and you can use your error type with a custom error type and stuff like that is in there. It's really, and we use it a lot. It works mm. nicely, but if you can use F-sharp, <laughs> do yeah, it all in F-sharp. You probably <laughs> will get discriminated units in C-sharp in some version. I, I yeah. heard rumors about that. Mm -mm. I mean, I know definitely that, of course, the thing, the big thing is that C sharp and F sharp compile to the same runtime, you know, the same intermediate language under the surface. So mm -hmm. a lot of what, uh, some of what's driving the move of C sharp into supporting both paradigms is F sharp. Mm -hmm. Like the F sharp guys ask for another functional feature into the intermediate, the intermediary language and C sharp gets it too, to some extent, as long as something is put into C sharp so that we can reference it. Uh, for whatever reason, they've left tail recursion out of that. But, um, you know, that's, you never know, we might get that one day. But, uh, so yeah, it wouldn't surprise me at all if we get discriminatory unions. Mm -hmm. There are some things that can't get closer together. For example, currying of functions. Because mm. currying of function is in direct conflict with uh, method overloading. Mm -hmm. ah. So we can't have both. So F sharp does it that if you have a class, in F sharp, you have method overloading, and if you are, have functions, you have currying. Mm -hmm. So, but, but you can't have currying in a method in a class. It's not possible. It's it's also not possible in F sharp. So there are concepts that conflict each other. Like is 
mutability or immutability by default. You can't just have one. You can't have both. So fair enough. That may uh, just be, may have to be a thing we just live without. I didn't get that. Sorry. Sorry, that may just have to be a thing we live without. Uh, currying. I didn't understand. Sorry. Sorry. Me, me either. <laughs> Sorry. Ignore me then. <laughs> All right. If we are done with questions rela related to the presentations, then I will stop the live streaming if that's all right for everybody. <laughs>